All right, everyone. We got our next talk with Harry Halpin here. He's going to be talking with us about NIM um, and what they're doing for the privacy space, the ecosystem. He's got a cool orange shirt. Uh, that's 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 what I notice right off the bat. So um, hopefully he can also tell us about where to get some of those because uh, I also want to be uh, very aggressive in my in my streetwear. So I'm going to hand this off to you. Go ahead and tell us all about NIM. Let's give him a hand. Okay, so can, how do I get my slides up? Is there a button I press or help? Is it up? Okay, cool. Okay, so basically the way we view it is that, you know, the, the defining problem of the next 10 years will be mass surveillance. Ultimately, as we see infrastructure like the Libra rolled out, um, even our what appeared to be revolutionary a blockchain used to publicly record financial tra transactions will be turned against us and transformed into a tool of total control. And on the other hand, the kind of NSA mass surveillance that Snowden has warned us about is now commercialized, being done by many different corporations in almost every single country. And we still, despite you know years of CCC and TOR funding, uh, still don't have a, any software that can resist passive global adversaries that can control 80, 90 percent of the network and observe it, like the NSA. So that's essentially the problems. And these problems that essentially all internet traffic is observable applies to all blockchain traffic as well. And even when you use Monero, including Atlantis, Zero knowledge proofs like Zcash, and of course, Ethereum and Bitcoin. Even if you manage to secure the on chain transactions, the peer to peer network traffic analysis can reveal who sent what traffic. That's what we recently saw in the attacks by uh, Kenny Patterson and everyone else on Zcash. And this applies also to Signal, right? So you can just watch the traffic. Even though we don't know the exact messages, we can watch the traffic going in and out. And I love Moxie, but it's a ridiculous problem. Going in and out of the signal servers. And Tor itself, a lot of people think it's like, allows, actually obscures metadata. But Tor effectively only obscures the IP address, the geolocation to some extent, and the identity of the last, uh, of your first hop into the network. So Tor doesn't defend against more complex and more powerful metadata attacks. Uh, as you know, Snowden discussed in his recent book, Permanent Record, Tor is really focused on the problem of anonymous Google searching for things like the CIA uh, to basically prevent them from having to make fake companies to host their fake searches, and doesn't actually obscure against the passive global adversary. And so just to summarize, we, we clearly have this problem of metadata being revealed, but also we, we can learn a lot of lessons from the Tor network. Uh, volunteer services in Tor, while the traffic, the users of Tor have increased dramatically, the amount of nodes has not increased dramatically. They have increased in capacity. There's a few large, uh, well-funded, subsidized nodes. CCC, Chaos Computer Club runs one. But the actual diversity and the geographical diversity of nodes has kind of leveled off and remained the same for the last few years, despite the rising uh, usage. And as we see with the recent YouTube uh, crypto ban, we're also seeing increased reliance on centralized services, which are then censoring uh, content. So how we dis what happened is that we approached uh, the European Commission and other folks a few years ago after the Snowden revelations, we said, look, you need to build, Europe can't trust only Tor. Uh, Europe needs its own more powerful infrastructure uh, to basically resist NSA level surveillance. So that's what led to startups like Chainspace, which were unfortunately acquired by Facebook to help build the Libra. That led to the Panoramics Research Project, which did a lot of the fundamental research. And that's the kind of strand that led to this, all the free software in this project. So what a mixnet does, uh, it's similar to Tor in many regards, 
there are multiple hops, but unlike Tor, it does two very special things. It adds decoy traffic, and it adds this decoy traffic is like fake traffic. There's not enough traffic going through the network. And it adds timing obfuscation by basically adding delays to each hop to prevent uh, de-anonymization attacks on the timing. And similar to Tor, it's a general purpose system that can build very large anonymity sets by running diverse applications. So this is kind of what a mixnet does. Uh, Sphinx packets, the same packet format used in the Lightning Network, comes into the network. Dummy packets are added as needed. Actually, the more traffic you need, the less dummy packets you need. Uh, each, at each hop, there's a timing a delay. And then eventually, the packets exit and are fully anonymized, even against global passive adversaries. And there's been a lot of work. A lot of it, this has been discussed at CCC over the last three or four years, uh, primarily by David Stanton. So Panoramics funded David to work on what's called cats and posts for using a mixnet over email. And that's good, but there's still some issues, which we're going to discuss with cats and posts. And then recently, cats and posts was forked somehow by some kind of fairly random person to build an Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum transaction anonymization network, but actually it's, it's just cats and post. Um, and there's, there's some problems that are inherent in the fundamental research around mixed networking. So these are the kind of papers we rely on, but this next slide and the rest of the talk is new work, which is, yet, which is currently either under review or unpublished, but which goes into the big issues that NIM has solved, building off the Lupix design, which underlies both cats and post and uh, Mason. So essentially, uh, one of the largest problems that Tor faces, but also uh, various Lupix uh, forks, such as Cats and Post and Mason, is essentially it's a centralized and permission PKI. So there, in order to use a mixed network, you have to know who's in the network. And that relies on some set of nodes being determined by a central authority or a voting authority. It's kind of unclear who gets to pick those nodes. And it's very dangerous because obviously a corrupt central PKI could defeat the security of the whole network. Um, most importantly, it's unclear if using, without the correct parameters, uh, Cats and Post and Mason and other Lupix forks actually adds any anonymity at all to your traffic. It's definitely, it's questionably better than Tor because the time of the delays and the amount of cover traffic depends on the amount of traffic coming into the network and that has to be set. And you, if you set it just once, the traffic changes. Those parameters may, never, may no, no longer give you a good anonymity set. And if you, you need to basically be able to dynamically set the amount of cover traffic and the delays. Uh, and lastly, you know, Mason specialized for Ethereum. Cats and Posts are sort of specialized for, depending on how David feels, Cat Shadow or whatever, uh, messaging frameworks. But the problem is by specializing your mixed network for a single use case, your anonymity set is the amount of people in that use case. So if you specialize for just Ethereum validators, your anonymity set is the number of Ethereum 2 validators out there that use you, which is like basically probably not very many. If you, if you make an awesome you know, OTR version 4 enabled whistleblower platform, your anonymity set is the amount of people who are whistleblowing on that platform. It's probably quite small maybe even be more dangerous to use that platform than not, right? So th these, are, these are legitimate problems. So you need a diverse set of applications, you need to dynamically parameterize the network, and you need to actually be decentralized. So how we solve these issues uh, is we basically, not surprisingly, use a blockchain uh, to store the PKI and other information necessary for operations for the NIM mixnet in a decentralized fashion. So there's no central authority that being corrupted. We just have a sort of standard consensus around uh, P the PKI. Currently, this is done on Tendermint. Uh, we need to basically be able to capture the amount of traffic and the patterns in it uh, in the input without de-anonymizing the users. So for that, we use what's called anonymous authentication credentials which are based on a revision of the Coconut Protocol, which was discussed at Chaos Computer Camp last year. But essentially, we have validators, which can anonymously measure the traffic and use that to feed the parameters for each epoch. And we basically choose the nodes by looking at, by doing essentially a check on their quality of service and rewarding them using NIM tokens uh, for actually effectively mixing 
the node, the, the network traffic. So the way, the way to think about it is there's a potential amount of traffic going through a mixed network, which we call the NIM pool, somewhat like the MIM pool. And then there's the amount of traffic that actually is mixed and get through the network. In every epoch, the nodes which successfully can prove that they've mixed the traffic uh, basically get rewarded. And this allows us to dynamically uh, scale the anonymity and the speed of the network as the traffic grows. And effectively, the number of tokens is indexed to the capacity of the network. And the mixed nodes and validators rewarded for quality of service. Nodes that don't deliver packets, that don't mix them, are kicked out. And when new traffic comes in, new nodes are added. And so the way to think about it is proof of mixing rather than mining. And we do this fairly, and this is a, perhaps a whole talk by itself, but effectively the concept is the validators do a commitment to randomized pass to the network. The randomized pass are chosen through a VRF, seated with a randomness pool. Each, at each sort of a hop of each Sphinx packet, there's a commitment to a Merkle tree. At the end of the epoch, you reveal your commitments of, to the randomized paths. And the uh, Merkle tree then can show who's delivered which packets, and those people are rewarded. And that's a really good idea from, I think, Leif Riggi originated the idea, calling it secret shopper traffic. And he originated for Tor, but it's a great idea for mixed networks. And Jeff Burgess was also kind of thinking in this direction. Uh, we have transaction fees as well. So if you send uh, cryptocurrency to the network on the first hop, you, you know, it can be revealed that you're sending cryptocurrency out or the last hop. And you can basically, we can take a fee to help pay for services. But we also want to support free services. And free services you know, can be supported simply by time locking tokens. And of course, they're sent out because eventually we don't want to have to reward people by inventing uh, magical internet money. We would prefer that people actually produce high value services. Uh, we have a whole complex validator system, which I will only briefly touch upon. But effectively, uh, we can transform tokens, the credentials that not only lets us kind of measure the amount of traffic going through the network to set the parameters to guarantee privacy, but this measurement is decentralized, it's anonymous. We use re-randomizable cryptography so you can't link a credential to a user. Uh, we include selective disclosure for both private and public attributes and pseudonym can be supported in lots of other advanced features. Uh, so this is the kind of network flow where basically you convert things to credentials, you ship them through the mix net, and you get to a service. And the service checks your credential against a blockchain. So this is our overarching timeline. You can view the code currently on GitHub. Uh, we're going to basically do debugging tomorrow, so everyone's invited. And that will hopefully let us launch the initial alpha mix net. Uh, we'll try to more officially launch it once we've debugged things tomorrow. And uh, by the end of 2020, after various iterations, we'll launch the mainnet to in mass surveillance. A, a humble but hopefully accomplishable goal in the kind of hacker wars that will take over in 2020. And we've taken all of the code, and we've, we have the docs for the code all online. So they're quite easy to view. You can see we have the mixnet code, the validator code. We are currently transitioning the mixnet out of Go to Rust because we got like a 15x performance increase. The Valdair code is still in Go. We'll probably eventually transfer all the code to Rust, but for the initial kind of test net, we'll, we will install both Rust for the mix nodes and some Go for the validators. Uh, we have, you know, Amir Taki and friends are working on wallets independently of us built on top of this code base. You can look at his code there. I think it's only command line, so not so exciting, but it does send stuff through the mixnet. Uh, we have someone, Roberto, has built a pretty awesome cross-platform mobile app uh, already on top of our network. Ah. And so, yeah, so it's, it's, I think we're basically having our workshop at 2 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, if, you, if you can't make the workshop, or even if you can, uh, this is the first revelation of the validator sign up. So you can sign up to be a validator. We'd be happy to get more validators and mixed nodes on board. We're looking for people that can really run, you know, really know how to run secure servers. And we're happy to work with you to set up the code to make sure distributed key generation works and all of the kind of more 
high tech components of the, of the software. And we're always available for any kind of question, both uh, on stage and off stage. And all of the people that manage to successfully set up a validator will get one of our uh, hot, somewhat Guantanamo orange, because that's what's going to happen to us if we don't actually in mass surveillance, hot t-shirts. And uh, even if you don't set up a mixed node or validator, we forgive you. You should still protect yourself. And we have these, uh, uh, how do you say, questionable uh, protect your assets NIM condoms. So, woohoo. So, yeah. So, anyways, I'm here to answer any questions. I hope that was informative. And uh, we think that basically the big bet of the 2020s will be can we use the technology around cryptocurrency and blockchains? to basically build a scalable, more privacy enhanced network level uh, infrastructure that can really end large scale mass surveillance. Thanks a lot. Okay, uh, go for it. Oh, Jesus, okay. Maybe, okay. In order, basically, maybe that way. Thank you, yeah, great speech, really inspiring, love it. Um, my, my question is around whether you can highlight the differences between what you're doing and what something like Orchid is doing on Ethereum. So yeah, like, so that, probably pros and cons. I could definitely uh, analyze that. It's also good to think about Orchid and Tor. Yeah. So essentially, if you're building something like Tor, which is to attempt to make privacy enhance uh, synchronous, let's say, uh, synchronous video or JavaScript web browsing, uh, effectively, it's going to be very hard to beat Tor. And Orchid's going to essentially have some incentivized VPN, which will be somewhat similar to Tor on some level. But the thing with those kinds of systems is that they, they do decentralize the traffic, but they don't provide that privacy against powerful adversaries. Because the adversary can watch the timing of the packets, and even the bits in the packet go from one node to another. Even if the bits are encrypted, an adversary can flip a bit in that packet and watch to see that flip bit come out on the other end. And uh, that's the case for Tor. It will be the case for Orchid. And it's essentially a trade-off between synchronous, high-speed VPN, uh, TCP IP style traffic, which essentially is what uh, Tor and probably Orchid are specialized for, and asynchronous message-based traffic that uses the Sphinx packet format and can re-randomize. At each hop, the, the ciphertext is completely transformed and unlinkable cryptographically from the next hop. And when you add timing delays, it's unlinkable in terms of metadata. And so that's the difference. And so I don't think that NIM and Tor are against each other. I think they're actually complementary. This is the understanding I have with Roger is that uh, essentially Roger was working on mixed nets before Tor, but at the time he said, oh, the internet's too slow. We can't do it. And there will still be a bit of latency loss with a mixed net because of the, the use of the Sphinx packet format. Now, we're going to look into speeding that up. Like I said, moving to Rust gave us a 15x speed up. But essentially, when it comes down to the cryptography, in order to use Sphinx, you have to use a lot more asymmetric crypto operations to get that unlinkability. You cannot do that with Tor and Orchid. They have to use, to get certain speeds, symmetric crypto. So that's the, sorry, it's a little bit complicated, but yes. Go so, uh, <clears throat> thank you. It's the first time I hear about Mixnet, so <laughs> uh, it's very interesting. Um, if I understand correctly, so basically you're uh, creating um, a Tor-like network where you're solving the, um, uh, the problem that you mentioned before by providing a reward for people who are running the nodes with tokens in this case, right? Is this correct? And the second part is regarding the PKI. Uh, so you mentioned on the PKI, so from what I understand, uh, which kind of protocol are you using? Are, are we talking about the X509 certificates and how do you solve the CRL and the OCSP problem if you are writing the PKI on top of the blockchain? Yeah, so, so okay, so there, there's, yes, we're creating a general purpose on enemy network which rewards nodes. So that's different than the volunteer basis of Tor. Now, Roger and Tor's thesis around not rewarding people is they say, well, look, if you reward the nodes, you're going to reward possibly adversarial behavior. If everyone's volunteer driven, then all the behavior is altruistic, and this attracts nicer people to run the nodes. Um, that's probably true. At the same point, our general thesis is that uh, it will 
altruism by itself scales up to a certain point, but in fact, there's only so many like really, I would say, privileged, nice people that can run Tor exit nodes. So we need to incentivize them at least to cover their legal cost and their cost of their hardware. Um, so that's, I think, the main difference. Um, in terms of the PKI, so literally, we just store the, we, we, ju we don't use X596, we just currently use, you know, ed25519 keys, uh, but which just allows the, 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 them to announce their location and assign that location. And essentially, rather than do a very complex certificate revocation, uh, we basically just always, at every epoch, we just store the new uh, consensus set of the nodes in the mixnet at, on every epoch. So essentially, everyone in the last epoch is revoked. In the new epoch, everyone could have even totally new keys, and that's kind of how it works. So we try to avoid the very hard problem of key revocation by essentially just always telling people, look at the latest timestamp version of the PKI on the blockchain. It's, there's probably more interesting ways to do it. I know Ian Goldberg's been working on some great stuff, but uh, we, we aren't doing that stuff yet. Hey, um, just a trick question. Uh, let's say I want to run a, a NIM validator node, right? Mm -hmm. And I want to hide my ass with NIM. Can I do it? I uh, there is a theoretical problem there which we have not quite solved. So the theoretical problem is not can you do it, because you can. There's no reason why you can't hide any network level data in NIM, and have a recursive NIM, so you're NIMing your, your NIM self. But the problem with that is then we do have to be able to identify you somehow to reward you. Uh, right? And currently, that's done with keys, which are attached effectively to IP addresses for the validators. Now, in the future, we do hope to let that be done by basically saying, well, if you want to run anonymous mixed nodes and anonymous validators, you would use essentially a, uh, a zero knowledge proof of key possession to prove you're in the key set and to prove you, can, you are owed this, this much reward without revealing your keys. That's totally not on the alpha network. We're actually working with Agalos, who's, I think Dionysus is somewhere in the audience, uh, Dionysus' advisor on this issue right now. Uh, but it is a very hard issue because it involves a little bit of complexity on the proof front and probably a lot of attack surfaces. So we don't want to launch a test net with that. It would be really awesome to launch a main net with those features. Thank you. OK, one more question. And maybe I don't know how much time. Um, what is the maximum delay that you can put in? So if you want to run new mess in basically very slow anonymity message store and forward network to gain maximum protection against a global observer adversary, what would be the maximum delay that you could put in there? Yeah, it's interesting. It's, it actually ends up being a little counterintuitive because uh, delays, and this is explained in the Lupix paper, which we build on, are effectively infinite. Right? And the reason why you want to have effectively infinite delays, or like, oh, sorry, theoretically infinite delays, is because you don't want the packets, like in the classic Chami install mixnet, which is what Elixir is, you basically get a, you get a bunch of packets, like you get five packets, and then you flush them all at once. But that reduces your anonymity set to five packets. If each packet has a randomized delay, which could be infinite, uh, even with a very, very small probability, uh, then the entire anonymity set of the n of the network is almost infinite in theory. So that's a much, we think, better, if slightly more probabilistic system. And we use what's called a Poisson distribution to choose those delays. Now, the in reality, what if your packet never gets delivered? That's why people stop using like the cypherpunk uh, email remailers, like Mixmaster and Mixminion, for example. And you want to know if your packet's been delivered. So the loop in Lupix is that you can basically get a loop message back that confirms your packet's delivered. So if you send the packet and it never, you never get a confirmation or you never see your transaction written to a blockchain, then you can just resend. In worst case, you get two packets sent with the same message and one of them's dropped. So in reality, uh, now that's in theory. In reality, what actually happens, which is a little bit counterintuitive, is the anonymity set depends on the delay, but it depends just as much on the amount of traffic coming through the network. So if you really want to be anonymous, you really want a huge, you want to be, that's why like we have a dodgy cryptocurrency use case, 
but we also have a messaging use case. So the 1,000 people that do messaging can help hide the 100 people that do dodgy cryptocurrency stuff. And this is very important because it's the amount of traffic that really gives you an anonymity set. And if your amount is too small, then you have to crank up the delay to get reasonable anonymity. Currently in our test net, uh, things are, the, the, the traf we get an anonymy set of a few, uh, it's measured in bits. And uh, it's a few thousand by doing a few second delay. So realistically, like five to seven seconds uh, on a very small network with like a few hundred users will give you an anomaly set of more or less all the users of that network. As the network gets more and more users, we can scale that back. So let's say we get 1,000 users, 10,000 users. Then we can start scaling that delay back as more traffic comes in and eventually get it down to the millisecond level, which is what I think is much more acceptable for cryptocurrency use cases. So how do you determine uh, if a node is actually mixing things and not just faking it? Do you have some kind of authority similar to the uh, Tor network that measures these nodes, or is that what the proof of mixing does? Yeah, that's what proof of mixing does. So I'll just outline the basic algorithm. Uh, the basic algorithm is that there's a shared randomness pool, there's a verifiable random function, which basically chooses sort of a seed and can produce a random path through the network. That path is not revealed. At the beginning of each epoch or time period, that path is written to the chain, and actually lots of them are written because you want lots of different tests. And then the network just is passing packets. And you don't know if the packet that you're passing is an uh, anonymous packet. Because it's anonymized, you don't know if it's basically a measurement traffic or not measurement traffic. It could be a user traffic. Uh, and then what happens is that at the end of the epoch, the commitment is revealed. And at every, as the packets pass nodes, there's a replay attack built into Sphinx. Sorry, replay attack protection build of Sphinx, where each node basically commits to a nonce, which is in each packet, to a Merkle tree that they host. What happens is when the VRF is revealed at the end of the epoch, the nodes can say, did I deliver that traffic or not? And they can basically reveal their commitments to the nonces, and that proves that they've delivered the packet, or at least they've tried to. Now, there's a, there's a catch. And that catches, it's very hard to determine if someone has just dropped a packet and they're blaming the guy that they were supposed to send the packet to, or I sent the packet and the next guy, the next node, dropped the packet. So you really detect the link. So in order to basically clean out the links, what you do is you send multiple measurement traffics through each node so you can get a statistical map of, well, this guy, you know, multiple nodes to this guy are dropping traffic, while, so he's prob it's probably that node dropping traffic and not the next hop. So you can consider it, um, Rick Dudley used the term uh, bail, uh, uh, parole officer traffic, and I like that term. So, you know, if you've dropped some traffic, then we double check you, and if you keep dropping traffic, then you get punished and eventually kicked out the network. Is there some smart contract that is actually requiring all the nodes to open their commitment in the end, and otherwise they get punished? Or yeah, you, may, the you have to reveal the okay. at the method. Otherwise, okay. I mean, we don't know what you're doing. Yeah. If you don't know what you're doing, it's, it, you could be acting maliciously, and then you basically should eventually leave the network. Okay, I see. Thanks. And that's why it's complex to make it all super anonymous, because then we have to basically do zero-knowledge proofs of all of that rather than just do that fairly simple algorithm that Jeff and other folks have been thinking about in which we just kind of overviewed verbally. It's, sorry, it's a bit of a like, cheeky question about like blockchains in general. Why does everyone think that people who use blockchains and cryptocurrencies are criminals? Like, why, why does everyone think that we're all just criminals? Oh, I don't think people that use cryptocurrencies are criminals. I, I don't either. It's very odd. Mark, I don't either, but I'm just walking Mark around Zuckerberg here. Many thinks people that's think that's a good idea, which is a many bit people disturbing. think we are Crypto um, criminals and scammers. Yeah, like, I, I mean, I know we're not. Yeah, I, I think that you know when people basically, um, I think that the philosophical point is that if people think you're hiding something, then it means you have something to hide. You've done something bad. Maybe you bought drugs over the internet, or maybe you're. Uh, 
sending nude pictures or whatever they think is uh, bad, maybe. Uh, but at the same point, I think there's a, a, essentially a philosophical debate where, where what we believe is that the ability to basically hide yourself from adversaries, which could be criminals, could be nation states, could be uh, anyone, uh, is the precondition for human freedom. You can't act freely, and there's lots of evidence of this, if you're in a total control society of complete surveillance. So I think rather than saying uh, only criminals need privacy, uh, you should sort of say, well, everyone needs freedom, and we, just as people need free software, uh, we should have freedom on the network level, freedom on our packet level, to defend all of our internet transactions, and those should be built in by default. They should have been built in by default on the original internet, but the technology was not you know, understood at the time, and this was, again, the 70s, a very long time ago. But now we have the capacity, and we understand technology enough that we can at least build these overlay networks on top of the internet in order to give us a guarantee, to some extent, of freedom on the network level. That being said, privacy is holistic, right? So if you leak on another level, you leak on a chain, you, your DAP or your app, you know, uses identifiers and leaks data, you know, we can't stop that on the network level. So what you really need is you need to basically build what we call full stack or holistic privacy throughout the entire network. And that's really hard to do. So we're going to start with the network level because otherwise it's like you're building a castle on top of sand. And, you know, the, your privacy if it gets wiped out on the network level, then it's just wiped out in general. Uh, so we hope that Monero and Zcash and, uh, you know, the, the validators, we've attracted a lot of interest for running mixed nodes and validators. We've attracted interest from Brave, from Blockstream, from Binance, from Zcash. I mean, we've attracted a very wide spectrum of interest uh, in this technology. And so I think that, that bodes well for, like, these large, diverse use cases that basically makes everyone more anonymous uh, together. So definitely, you know, stop by tomorrow or at least sign up uh, if you're interested and we'll send out the documentation and everyone will get these awesome orange t-shirts and otherwise uh, the man will surveil you and send you to Guantanamo eventually. Take care. Let's give a hand. Thank you so much, Harry. My biggest question was where to get those orange t-shirts. You remember at the beginning of this talk and he just told me that that's what I'm taking from this talk. Um, I don't know about the rest of you. Uh, so we will be back in about five minutes. Uh, with our next talk, we currently have uh, a workshop going on with Swiss Crypto Economics that started maybe 10 minutes ago. Um, so if it, they're looking at kind of KYC AML practices. By all means, go check that out as well. We have another workshop that's going to be coming up. Let me pull this up on my phone right here. Um, blah, 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 blah. Intro to Pope, P-O-A-P, -P, starts at... 16.55, 4.55, so in about 20-ish minutes. That's also, I think, going to be at Swiss Crypto Economics. Man, they're just killing it with the workshop these days, unless I'm get, uh, falsely giving them credit and somebody is very offended over there right now. Uh, but coming up next, we got the digital integrity of the human person with Alexis. He's going to be coming up here. We're going to get him all set up, so stick around if you're interested in that. And if you're not, stick around anyway to make him feel like he has an audience. <laughs>